It is my pleasure this evening to introduce Rick Moody, who is here to discuss his new book, The Long Accomplishment, a mem memoir of struggle and hope in matrimony. As a writer, Rick Moody is very hard to pin down. He has an extensive body of work. He's the award-winning author of a broad range of books in, uh, which have a variety of different forms and settings. They include the novel The Ice Storm, the memoir The Black Veil, and the dystopian satire The Four Fingers of Death. I believe he is on record as saying that he would not write another memoir after The Black Veil and that he considers himself a fiction writer through and through. But the long accomplishment is the harrowing true story of the first year of his second marriage, a marriage he began as a recovering alcoholic and sexual compulsive with a history of depression. It is, in his own words, a story in which a lot of bad luck is the daily fare of the protagonists, but in which they are also in love. This evening he will be in conversation with Jackie Lydon, a news reporter who was a correspondent and host for NPR from 1979 to 2014. Since 2014, she has hosted The Seams, an occasional series about fashion and culture that airs on NPR. Please join me now in giving them both a very warm welcome to Politics and Prose. Hi, everyone. Hi, Rick. Um, do you want me to explain? The yes, yes, and, and uh, yes. Oh, okay. I think that would um, be a good idea. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I Because I'm so uncomfortable in this setting and especially on book tour I begged Jackie to read with me I begged her to do so and I said we should read your book yeah but I love her book so much and and am so honored by her presence that I was really hoping she would read a little bit so will you read a little I bit? would so love to I haven't read Sheba here in Washington for a while and uh, thank you for that I was prepared to do I'm so uh, I don't uh, host this um, podcast that uh, Amanda was talking about um, any longer the seams just I just want to set the record oh. straight that's okay I'm writing full-time and doing workshops and a couple of the people in our authors group are here tonight and I am honored to read with you because uh, we've met through Yaddo the arts colony at Saratoga Springs and I have been your avid fan I mean I think I could almost quote from the beginning of Purple America which uh, at our household now in Wisconsin I sometimes think about although my mother hasn't fallen down quite that far yet. But anyway, you're just um, one of my most admired um, literary folks. So, you know, and we always have fun when we see each other, even though it's not so. So Rick asked me to read from Daughter of the Queen of Sheba. And I will do that. And this is a memoir. Uh, I'm now working on my second. There's been a couple of struggles with it. Um, and it's about growing up with my bipolar mom. And uh, she, you will see that she bequeathed me Mesopotamia. And I became a Middle East correspondent, uh, even though I'm from a town of 500 people in rural Wisconsin. You want that so you don't have to hold the mic. Oh, I'm fine. I, Mike and I are pretty friendly at this <laughs> point in my life. <laughs> All right. This chapter's, Oh, Miss America, you are so beautiful to me. My mother's hand was open like a bisque cup, all porcelain, and Christ Jesus' fingers were tentacles entangled around her palm. Christ Jesus appeared to her as a white octopus, luminescent in the darkness, deep in the middle of the night in our small town of Menominee, Wisconsin. It was 1966. I was 12. My mother was young and beautiful, married to a man who didn't appreciate her nighttime disquisitions with Reverend Lord. Jesus said, take my hand, my mother explained to me a quarter century later. He said, Dolores, you are destined to do great things. He said, Dolores, I will exalt you through a thousand contests of the soul and the summits of all mountains and always be with you. Well, someone had to be. Her conversation with Jesus was hardly a non sequitur, and everything happened to us after that. My stepfather was the one in charge, not God. He was a doctor in our provident town and owned a small hospital and clinic which treated half the populace who granted him authority over their lives and paid him not only with cash but barter trade. Buckets of blueberries, cartons of tomatoes picked by hand smelling of motor oil. We lived above the clinic 
on a fragment of a lush old farm on Lac Le Jolie. Having money walled us in, I thought. It afforded my stepfather a manner of universal disdain, accented by his height and his dark, ungraying hair, which was slicked back like Clark Gables into a shining crest. To the people in our town, my stepfather was Richard Corey in the poem by Edward Arlington Robinson. He glittered when he walked. The day after my mother had her first vision, without saying anything to anyone, he drove her in his banana yellow Cadillac to Wagner's Hospital. Wagner's was an old mansion that had been turned into a home for the mentally ill on an estate at the edge of town beneath heavy and towering pines. I had heard that there were souls snaking in the branches and that the fate of unfortunate people was decided there, a fate reflected in the spectral light that shined through the pine boughs surrounding it. The shagged-off bark of the pines looked like the whorls of fingerprints, as if the trees had been touched by ghost escapees who cast hunched shadows on Wagner's long circular drive. I could imagine my stepfather striding through the trees at Wagner's, parting the shadows like so much velvet drapery at daybreak. Nervous breakdown, he denounced to the receiving nurse, and my mother was small and mute beside him, more like a pretty child than a wife. He signed her into Wagner's locked wards, and that was all we knew. Nervous breakdown. I wrote the words in my diary on October the 1st, 1966. I was a diarist from the time I could write, and I wrote on anything I could find. Drug company calendars discarded by my stepfather, church envelopes, manila folders, and shirt cardboards, autograph books, and my white plastic Girl Scout diary with its gold trefoil and lock. I imagined my mother's nervous breakdown was like a maypole unraveling reversing the centrifugal force, the streamers of her mind spinning backward in one grand rush. Perhaps that's how the mind loosened, with a snap, a fluttering sound, its images in tatters. It was my grandmother who used that word breakdown first. Your mother's in the nuthouse, she said that very first afternoon, tears winking over her face. Nervous breakdown. It's like she's got car brakes and the car brakes is gone. No control. She's tired. Her nerves is shot. She needs a rest. She doesn't even know who she is. My grandmother was a peasant and a rebel. She had the thickness of tallow in her voice, and she rubbed animal fat onto her red knuckles and face when she skinned a beaver or a mink. I loved her almost as much as I love my mother. She believed in lies, or as we called them in the Irish tradition, stories. The more elaborate, the better. And if stories had been gemstones, then my grandmother would have offered to me the Hope Diamond or the Jewel of Jamshid, the greatest star in Persia, because there was no story too great to offer her daughter or granddaughter. Which is why we almost never believed her. But I believed her that afternoon. Nervous breakdown meant nothing to her, unless it meant a heart attack of the spirit. And I was grateful to her. Had Mabel, my grandmother, not come to stay with us, I would have been alone in that house with my stepfather. Then I might have been tempted to crush his brain with the piece of petrified stone I kept above my bed. Or I might have run away and joined the rodeo, which I did not affect until some years later. But how could I run away? Kate and Sarah and I and Mabel and my mother, Dolores, names like the rays of the compass. They were the world of visible magnetic force, and I could no more abandon them than rearrange the continents. My mother learned, however, that when the old geography became too painfully familiar, she didn't have to invent to abandon it. She invented a country of her own. And I'll just read being bequeathed. So after this um, time in the uh, mental hospital, I, you know, everything that I've read there is pretty much how it happened. And... Uh, I see a friend here tonight with whom I've done a lot of work in mental health advocacy. We can talk about that when we talk. But that is what we called it back at the time. I wouldn't, you know, obviously say that someone was in the nuthouse today. But um, I kept trying to picture her, what a nervous breakdown was. The words locked in my diary. Nervous breakdown meant my mother slackened and sank, where before she was perpetual movement, and our lives were the synthesis of that movement. Those were the days of my great religiosity, Bible classes, communion classes, supplicant prayers. 
I pictured my mother's form caught in a pillar of light, as was the kneeling Mary Magdalene on the flyleaf of my Bible, forever keeping watch in the Garden of Gethsemane. My mother would be sculpted and frozen solid, encased by the Gethsemane moonlight, she and Mary Magdalene on their knees together. And just as I was getting used to that image, my stepfather brought her home. So about two weeks after she got home, I found her alone in the kitchen. And this will just be the last little thing I'll read. Um, she was very quiet. She, I say that she sort of reminded me of a fawn. She'd kind of spring away if we talked to her. She always had this faraway look in her eyes. And I felt protective of her. And I came home from school, and she was home alone, which was unusual. My grandmother had my younger sister someplace. And I asked her if she was all right, and she said yes in a distant and small voice, not satisfied with her response. I sat with her a while and then went to my room to change clothes. I curled up on my bed for a moment, intending to go back and jolly her up. I'd make her a treasure hunt. She found those amusing. Each clue would be a flower, something exotic, like a hyacinth or a bird of paradise. My mother had painted my room lavender and hung lavender drapes, the first room of my own, a peace offering for having to live in my stepfather's house. And in my room, I could stack as many books as I liked. I was reading one about both the Mayans and the Aztecs and how the latter worshipped among the dark ziggurats of the Mexican plains. It was my other culture's period. I was dancing somewhere with the feathered hordes, holding a spray of quetzal plumes when there was a knock on my door. Then the door opened and a vision stood there. I am the Queen of Sheba, my mother announced to me in a regal voice. She had taken the silky yellow sheets from her voluptuous bed and twisted them around and around her torso like a toga, leaving one shoulder as white as a gardenia, bare except for her bra strap. She'd used her eye pencil on her arms, the same one with which she lined the upper and lower inner lids of her eyes, and drawn hieroglyphics. Her long auburn hair was swept up and crowned with an old tiara that we girls had played with as little children, pretending to be lost princesses. She looked at me solemnly. I am the Queen of Sheba, she murmured confidentially, and I bequeath each of my three daughters a country. To you, Jackie, the oldest, Mesopotamia. To your sister, Kate, Thebes. And to my youngest daughter, Sarah, who is nine, Carthage. And then my mother moved her shoulders from side to side in the dreamy undulation of a tribal dance and twirled her fingers in the air as if she wrought from it the great gift of an enchantment. Then she silently mouthed an incantation and blew me a kiss, backed up, pulled the door shut, and was gone. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, it really is the case that memoir is, is sort of a terrifying form, and one reason it's terrifying is um, sort of how vulnerable you feel in audience settings. So part of the reason that it's so great to have Jackie here is to have someone who's also performed this performance of being vulnerable in public this way, and she does such a great job of it in the book. I just wanted to have a ally in this project so all right so um my book is uh sort of one long sequence of really grim bad luck after another uh grim incidents of bad luck and and because it's so sad i've been sort of trying to figure out a way to um interact in the bookstore such that it's not quite as devastating as it is in spots. So I've I've sort of cobbled together a little short passage from the beginning that's timely because it's about a cultural figure who, whom you will recognize quickly. If I were to pick an emblem, an objective correlative for the year 2013, it was my Charles Manson autograph. The story comes from the writing world, at least initially, and it starts like this. I knew this literary fellow who was doing some hard time. I think a number of writers knew him. Another writer told me that this guy, doing the hard time, wanted to write to me, and would I write back? 
I had no objection to writing back because my own behavior had always made me sympathize with people given to the occasional horrible decision. I felt sympathy for the victims of crimes, of course, but I also felt great waves of compassion for the men and women who somehow seemed to do a poor job of living their own lives and who then wound up in the penal system. I wrote back to the guy doing the hard time, and we wrote back and forth throughout the rest of his interval inside and later when he was living as an ex-con in Ohio. I helped him name his dog. We talked about contemporary literature, of which he knew a lot. I think he knew Allen Ginsberg personally, and maybe William S. Burroughs. Often the guys living on the edge of the law know and admire the beats. Have you noticed? Sometime later when this guy, who insisted that he had not committed the crime for which he was interned, was just another person on the margins of the literary world, I had occasion to review a certain book that I much esteemed. The book was Building Stories by the graphic novelist Chris Ware. I ordered the book, and then I also got a free copy for the or- from the organ for which I was reviewing, and then suddenly I had two copies. This was not the strangest thing in my life, but it happened to coincide with my partner, Laurel, telling me about a certain conceptual art project named One Red Paperclip. I think the blogger who undertook this work is called... Kyle McDonald. And McDonald, through a series of 14 trades, managed to turn a single red paperclip into a farmhouse in Saskatchewan. I think probably McDonald was an unusually shrewd negotiator, and he had some very excellent allies in his project. Or, and this part is undeniable, he got a lot of very good publicity for it, and this enabled trades that anyone would admire or find exceedingly creative. I'd been looking around to try something similar because it sounded like so much fun, and I decided that I would trade my second copy of Building Stories to whomever offered me something really incredible for it, after which I would try to trade that item to someone else, and so on. This proposition, the bartering of the extra copy of Ware's book, generated a fair amount of discussion on Facebook at one point, and I believe one guy did invite me to stay for a week in Italy or maybe Greece. But because I'm shy and can't really stand being anyone's guest for long, I did not take the weekend in Greece. How foolish. I think there were some other interesting offers, too, but I decided that the best offer, for no reason that I can recreate now, was the postcard signed by Charles Manson. Of course, it came from the guy I knew who was staying in the federal penitentiary. Apparently, he had not only been corresponding with literary writers in those years, but also with some hardcore criminal types. I don't know the extent of it, but somehow he had found himself attempting to correspond with Charles Manson. If you are my age, you perhaps, like I do, associate Charles Manson with a certain kind of California, with LSD and the out-of-control period of the Beach Boys, with deranged interpretations of Beatles songs, with the summer of love and its philosophies converted all at once into the obverse, into malevolent and incoherent evil. You associate Charles Manson with that book Helter Skelter by Vincent Bugliosi and Kurt Gentry, and with the photos of Lynette Squeaky Fromm in the police cruiser relieved of her firearm after her attempt to assassinate Gerald Ford. Maybe the younger persons turning these pages don't know as much about Manson and his band of followers or associate him primarily with any list 
of dangerous and legendary serial, serial killers that includes Richard Ramirez, John Wayne Gacy et al., all available on the internet. But the psychedelic California, the bad acid California of that lost time, that's how I think of him. I can't say exactly why my friend thought procuring and storing up the Manson postcard was a good idea, and perhaps it was simply that he was killing time and wanted some memorabilia associated with his residence. I can't say exactly why I thought it was a good trade either, except that perhaps it would be easy to trade to someone else. I think I still felt bad about my friend's incarceration, and so I wanted to help him out. Apparently, I couldn't see, at least initially, the obvious menace of the object. My friend's cover letter, which followed with the postcard, said this, New Year's Day, 2013. Hi, Rick. Here's Charlie. Hope he arrived intact. The poem on the back is not by Manson, but by his prison secretary. Signature on the front is Charlie's, signed Mick Manson. Note the swastika through his last name. What a guy. Then my friend wrote a few pleasantries and concluded with, quote, Ah, the curse is lifted. Just kidding. Maybe, unquote. The Manson signature is on the front of an old fashioned picture postcard, laterally across a photograph of a squirrel standing in a posture that I suppose I would describe as erect, sort of waving at the camera with one hand from his perch atop a stump. The inscription in blue ballpoint does, in fact, say Charles McManson and there is a sort of swastika. The poem on the reverse goes as follows. Friends, countrymen, lend me your ears. All knowledge is moonshine. We are here, and it is now. The little zen for Charlie. Let's review the lamentable facts. I wrote a book review of a book I really loved, and then I decided to trade my extra copy of that book, hoping that I could, through some conceptual art smarts, convert that book ultimately into a house in Nova Scotia or maybe Newfoundland. And somehow I determined that the first thing I should trade for was a postcard signed by a guy with a swastika carved into his head, who was responsible for the murder of seven people. It is true that when I was an undergraduate at Brown University, there was a professor in the film department who had once made it his business to publish a chapbook of Manson's remarks from his sentencing hearing in 1971. And in the giddy, sometimes repellent political environment of Brown circa 1983, this publication was considered revolutionary. However, I have also read comments by Sharon Tate's sister, that is the sister of one of Manson's victims, and I found them heartrending and persuasive. I can only say that I felt that the Manson signature, which I imagine is one of many circulating out in the world, Manson signatures start at $100 and go up from there, would be valuable for my bartering project. You would have thought that the appended note at the bottom of the covering letter, ah, the curse is lifted, would have been the sign, or that I would have felt a slight chill at reading the poem with its ominous and eastern, all wisdom is moonshine, we are here and it is now. Sort of reminds you of that koan that suggests that if you meet the Buddha in the road, you should kill him. And yet... Much of the contemporary outsider language orbit, orbiting around Charles Manson tends to overlook the horror done by him, and so I can say only that I did what many others have done, which is to say, for a moment, I neglected the facts. 
I averted my gaze and allowed the Charles Manson signature into my apartment in Brooklyn, where it sat in a drawer. The trouble began immediately. So I have a question. Sure. Um, I think, so you've written, this is two memoirs, a lot of autobiographical pieces, but two memoirs. And I know that I thought I would never, ever, ever write another memoir about my family. And I have reversed that decision. And it seems as if you have as well. Uh, Well, you have. By the way, the Manson stuff is utterly compelling. (laughs) And who knew that once upon a time in Hollywood would be coming out the same summer. Um, No, your whole whole memoir is so um, unsparing and uh, guides us through one absolutely one act of the maelstrom after the other so what was what was kind of the catalyst why did you decide okay i want to do another memoir um it was so that this time that i wrote about was so uh demanding and and sort of uh um overpowering that i found that i i couldn't write fiction and um even though that's the thing that I love to do best, uh, the sense of events kind of coming at s- with such rapidity that I had not recovered from one when the next arrived um, got in the way of the imaginative impulse. Uh, and so when I went to try to write something, I could only find that trying to sort of put the stuff down on paper in a way um, was within reach and possible. And I don't know that I would say that it was therapeutic. I'd be interested to see if you feel memoir writing is therapeutic. It it was not therapeutic, but it did enable me to sort of sit back and look at stuff in a way and get purchase on it, such as I had not done until that time. Just for those who haven't yet read... um, Uh, the long accomplishment. Each it's organ. Each ch- chapter is a month of this year, two thousand, uh, be- beginning in October of two thousand thirteen. Well, I wrote to someone the other day. I said the only way to make the insensible sensible to me is to write, and I think that is true. And I think that um, for a long time, I felt that. I could hold the world at bay and that I didn't have time. It's interesting you say that um, reality got in the way of the creative impulse, but there's also a lot of unreality that is occasioned by these bad acts happening or these things that you cannot control happening. Uh, In your case, you and your wife were trying to get pregnant um, through the IVF procedure and just, you know, and then there were, there was a, there were, Everything you went through, everything from you know, a home, a couple of home invasions to uh, deaths. So, I I think that in my case, I felt like I, with this first memoir, I wanted to have a conversation with someone on the page that I couldn't have in real life. I mean, my mother really did become the Queen of Sheba, and then later it was Marie Antoinette and the CEO of a Fortune 500 company called Creative Renaissance by Design, and (laughs) Think About Me was her motto. I once came home to an absolute ziggurat made of uh, coffee cups, each one emblazoned with the motto, Think About Me. (laughs) And I think it says on the page, oh, mom, as if we could do anything else. And, you know, when I got a contract for my book and I was at Yaddo, the very first, so, you know, that to me is just like, oh my God, I'm at Yaddo, Saratoga Springs, beautiful town. I had been there in the program you teach in um, at, at Skidmore, only my teacher was David Reef, who did say to me, Jackie, you have a book here. And I was just like, okay, this is Susan Sontag's son, all right. You know, and, um, but I... Remember that when I got to Yaddo, I got a phone call, day one. And in those days, you know, it's pre-cell phone. 
and they're never supposed to disturb you. But so this was something bad. And I thought, well, my mother's, my mother's killed herself or something. And uh, I went and it was my agent from New York. And she said, guess what? Uh, your mother called up Houghton Mifflin today and she threatened to sue your ass off and sue their asses off if you, another wrote it, if you wrote another word about her. And I had just been home to Wisconsin the week before and had her sign a permission and um, shown her the press release that the publisher was going to put out and told her, you know, how important this would be to people with mental illness. And she, and I, so I was, just, and, and my agent said, and then I called the publisher, and the publisher said, uh, just remember, we, we, until I have all the contracts from your family, we don't have a deal. And I just saw my life flashing in front of my eyes. So I called a girlfriend who'd also written the memoir and said, what, did I, what do I do? And she said, you tell your mother that the two of you are going to be on the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> We were on the Oprah Winfrey show. It was a few years later, but I called mom and I said, it was the next day, I needed to like really sleep on it because this was going to be like my life. And I said, mother, um, you know, someone called up Houghton Mifflin yesterday and they were impersonating you and using some rather uh, foul language. And she said, that was no impersonator, that was me. And I'm going to sue their asses off if you write another word about me, and you too. And I just, I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I said, well, Mom, you know, I got this book advance, and, um, you know, maybe you would like, and I quoted a sum, and it was better after that. I had always intended to give her some. So I wasn't really, like, jumping up and down to write a, another family memoir, um, but it just became necessary to... So this time I feel like life can be a little unreal and I'm talking to reality. And last time it was just the opposite. It's my story and I'm sticking to it. I didn't have to get permissions from my family, but I did have a grueling legal department read. Did you have that? No, not in 1997. We'll see what happens next time. Yeah, I had to sit with the guy on the phone for many hours as he went over everything, you know, with a fine-tooth comb. Yeah, well, we live in different times now, you know, and it's an interesting thing as a, as a memoir writer. I mean, you, ha you have a lot of actual names in here. You know, we meet real people. Um, you have to tread very carefully, I, I would imagine. Um, what about your ex-wife? Somehow you must have navigated that. Not that you said anything too terrible. I thought you were generous, but that's tricky territory. Yeah, that was already in the divorce agreement. She knew me well enough to know <laughs> that at some point in the future she could conceivably get written about, so it had already been legislated ahead of uh -huh. time. Aha, the prenup. The pre-divorce thing. The pre-divorce thing. Yeah. yeah. We don't have anything like that in, in our family. Um, but that, that, that was good. And also the way that you, um, you, I think you do limb between the horror of these events occurring, uh, a child's unexpected death, not Rick's child, um, <clears throat> the, the loss of some friends, the suicide of an online friend. You're going through this divorce, which just sounds, I mean, you and your wife had had drifted along. You you had you weren't really walking into that marriage like oh I want to get married. You would you were sort of. I mean we all take responsibility for ourselves, but it, what you were talked into it a wee bit. I mean you exceeded, right? It wasn't really the wedding that you would have planned, for example. Nothing like the second marriage. I just hope she's not back there hiding. <laughs> but um, that that you then you then sort of save your sanity through not only writing but reading Dante and Cervantes and Beckett and it it was great spending time with you in your time of trial I, I just want to I just want to underline the reading Dante during hard times thing it was so great <laughs> um, I have this online reading group, so we read Dante one canto every two weeks. And uh, and it 
saved my butt on many occasions when things were really dire. In this year of purgatorio. Yeah. Um, in, why do you think that, so, so were you, um, so this all happened 2013, 14, and in really all the way into 2015. And had you been kind of taking notes along the way? Or, I mean, it's not so long ago. I suppose you'd have to make extensive notes, but. I didn't really take notes. I never take notes, and I'm not a diarist. I'm not you know? much. Yeah, I, yeah. I, do, I do, but not that often. Yeah. So I just sit down when it's my time to sit down. And then, fortunately, I'm married to someone with a really great memory. So if I failed on certain counts, she was there to sort of write the craft a little bit. And it's hard, too, to write about a spouse. You know, one of the reviews that I read about your book, and, and I actually paid attention because I'm going to have to write about my marriage in my new book. And I've already written that chapter. I haven't shown it to my husband. Um, it, it It's... It, I mean, if you're a memoirist, the whole notion is you're peeling off your skin, right? Because you, you, you're going to show your beating heart and you're going to show where you were fallible. But, and that's okay for me, but I sometimes feel like, well, what about, what about the, my loved ones? You know, what about, um, will they feel embarrassed? Will they feel, but you just can't think like that or you would be paralyzed. My wife was very supportive of the book and a lot of the, my wife's a visual artist and, and actually, a, I think if I can be immodest, quite a great visual artist and, and, uh, and her way of telling stories is with images and she's very narratively uh, fixated on the properties of pho photography and film and so on. And, and therefore I think it's fair to say she's a storyteller of a kind. Um, she just doesn't write that often. She writes a tiny bit, but not often. And so when I embarked on this process, I embarked on it with the idea that it's a given that at a certain point, she gets to tell her side of the story. And in fact, at, at an early, in an early juncture of this writing process, I was gonna have her write a, an appendix where she could respond, you know, in any way that she wanted. She just didn't get around to it because she's not a, she's not a nativist where uh, writing is concerned. But she's already sort of started making photos and so on that overlap with this material. Mm. And so it was always my assumption that I was not trying to tell the story for the both of us, but that there would definitely be an interval after which she would reply, you know, in her way. And um, and that was enough for me. But at the same time, as you say, one wants to do good for one's family and friends. And I definitely entered into this book with no wish to grind any axes. Well, so I hoped that it that it would be tolerable to her and others. I'm wondering if I can. <laughs> I'm wondering if I can actually say that about my um, new book because. In it, I refer to my, it's a, it's a memoir that is centered around the last 15 years of my life and centered around caregiving and uh, the changes that have, have come, uh, job loss, um, trying to create a new identity as my mother is uh, failing basically, but, but then sometimes rising so it's not even predictable. We can't just say, you know, we're, we're, we're decelerating and I want to keep her going. And I, I think that I'm writing in order to weave a narrative that keeps everyone together. And I know that it's rather impossible, but I must do it anyway. Um, I say in this new book that I had my first newspaper, which my mother helped me create, uh, it was a one sheet, and it was called The Family News, and we ran it off on the mimeograph machine, and I would just look, you know, make the boxes, the old newspaper, you know, newspaper boxes, and then write a story uh, in them. And she was always a star because she was such great material. <laughs> and I think that um, now, though, you know, it's 2019, and... I'm a writer. My middle sister is our primary and paid caregiver, paid in part by me. 
And our, my youngest sister's an elder care lawyer, a really sharp elder care lawyer. And she said to me, not long ago, she said, don't you think that you're the only one who's the narrator around here? And I thought, oh my God, what, what does that mean? And I'm actually kind of trying to recraft what this book is supposed to do, not the text of the book, but the pitch. And I said, you know, from my sister's perspective, I may be quite an unreliable narrator. So I'm going to have to um, encompass that somehow. Because my sister said, well, when your book's published, I want to go out on the road with you. And I'm like, ah! <laughs> But at the same time, when we get to Denver, I can hardly not invite her, you know. So it's it's tricky for memoirs. It really is. It's it's. Sometimes people would say, "Oh, so is your mother dead?" And I'd say, "Nope, not not a bit of it." And uh, I I think that the prism that you put on people, if it is done with generosity, and if you are as I want to say the word remorseless, but I'm going to use that word, as remorseless on yourself or as understanding of yourself as you are with others, then one would hope that it's all of a piece, that you get to a place. Yeah, I agree. Should we let them ask a question? Yeah. Anyone have any questions? This is Florence Williams, and she's writing a memoir. Mm-hmm. Therapeutic. And I, I heard someone once say that memoir is actually not at all therapeutic for the person who's writing the memoir, but it can be therapeutic for the reader. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if that sort of, you know, impelled you at all. That's such a beautiful question and, and, and much on my mind. And I think in a way the, the answer is that I made the book for my kids. You know, because part of what the book's about, I don't want to give away the ending or anything, but there's a long, long struggle uh, with infertility in the center of the book um, uh, with all the bad news that goes with that, you know, on multiple occasions. And, um, uh, and the ending puts a positive punctuation mark on that struggle. And, uh, and I had an older daughter. I have a 10-year-old now. And, you know, we really did go through a hellacious period. And I felt like, wouldn't these kids want to know, you know, what happened, uh, what the struggle was before? At some point. They may not want to know until they're 25, you know. But, uh, but I wanted to sort of leave a trace of that behind. And the fact that my wife and I worked on, on the on the treachery of it all together and that we try to do it in a loving way, you know, her part of her work, my wife's work is documentary. She's very, um, given to the documentary impulse and to her, that's a very important, um, rationale for doing this, that it's documentation and that it's, it sticks around so that people have a resource when they want to ask questions about a time and what it felt like. And I, I think that was also a great question because Florence, I, I'm forgetting that you are writing a memoir about the science of the heartbreak of divorce and the science of heartbreak, right? Am I, am I sort of? Is it cathartic? Um, it puts the energy somewhere, I think. It puts, you know, it does make the insensible sensible. I know for myself, I didn't think that writing my memoir or writing this one now is therapy because that's what I do you know with a therapist in therapy a guy who's been with me from the beginning who I talk to every couple of weeks and he's always like you have to you have to deliver this book Jack you have to birth this book and I was like I don't have any children and it just makes me uncomfortable to hear him talking about it like that it's bad enough that the book's supposed to be therapy now it's supposed to be a child too and it's just so um but I think that it is the legacy of our days. And to me, as a journalist, you know, because I'm, I'm talking later this week, what's the difference between fiction and nonfiction? What do they, what do, I mean, journalism and nonfiction, what do they have to say to each other? Um, and I think where you come from, permission is, is one of those places, giving yourself permission. Um, other questions from folks? 
I, I can ask you a question if, if people want to gather their thoughts for a minute. Um, there's a scene in this book, I don't think it would give anything away, in which I thought it was fascinating. You decide to kind of whirl yourself away from the action in this bizarre thing called the, the Odyssey, what was it, the Odyssey Theater? Odyssey Works. Odyssey Works, Odyssey Workshop. Can you just tell us what that is? So in 2013, I applied to be an audience member for this theater company, Odyssey Works. They make rather dramatic theatrical pieces for an audience of one. So they basically very carefully research your life and then create this sort of meta narrative that embeds in your life and it's for you alone. And usually it lasts for a couple of weekends, but in my case, they got some kind of big grant and they wanted to try expanding. So the embedding lasted for two months. And during the two months, ordinary occurrences, like this would be an example. Let's say we were sitting here doing this. And there was a guy in the front who kept asking sort of particularly <laughs> weird questions uh, or who appeared to have some knowledge of my life that was uncomfortable <laughs> for me. Such a thing would happen. And then at the end of the reading, you know, we would all go on our merry way. And 15 minutes later, I'd be standing in the street going, what the hell was the guy sitting in the front? What was that? And it was sort of two months of this. Occasionally, I would look out the window and see someone performing modern dance <laughs> in a red outfit <laughs> sort of right out there. In fact, I was teaching at Skidmore that summer, <laughs> and, I, and some poor dancer had come all the way, you know, four hours north from New York <clears throat> and was dancing outside of my classroom, you know. So it was sort of this crazy thing that happened, and I put it in the book as a, a spot of levity in the middle of... A spot of, the, of levity in the mo <laughs> in the most difficult section of the book. Yeah. Well, well, it certainly does whirl us away. But I kept thinking, oh my God, his life's all is already, um, you know, just completely inside a tornado, and now he's literally being whirled away too. And this is just crackers. But I thought to myself, well, Jackie, you know, you've had loads of crackers incidents as a foreign correspondent. And I, I used to think that I felt a great kinship to Rutger, Rutger Hauer at the end of Blade Runner, where he talks about the sea beams on Mars. And that you, I don't want to give away where you go and what happens to you. But it's right up there with, uh, with Rutger Hauer. And uh, I'll give that part away. They kidnapped me and took me to Saskatchewan. It's true. True story. So there's your red paper clip. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have another question, I think, coming up here. Yeah, I'll ask a question since no one else seems to be. Since you have sort of an um, intense contemplation of uh, Charles Manson, do you have any special insights about the recent movie, Once Upon a Time in uh, Hollywood? I do not, and for a single reason, which is that because I have very young children, I, I have no time to go to the movies. Although I did watch Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse with my <laughs> three-year-old and thought it was great yesterday, but I've seen nothing. I have a lot to say about earlier Tarantino films, but not that one. Hi. 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 Okay, a question about fragments of memory and a memoirist versus a novelist in terms of working, you raised that slightly before, of dealing with fragments of memory. In a novel, you can build a story around a fragment. When you're a memoirist and you're looking at something, how do you, how do you distinguish between the fragment versus what you end up telling. That's an awesome question. You want to try to tell. Yeah, and, and it's a good question. And, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of workshops with other writers um, to, to our, here tonight um, over the last couple of years, and I really love doing it because one of the things that I realized that I took with me from NPR, I was an NPR host and correspondent for 34 years. So, I mean, I really grew up with that sense of assembling stories and, and putting things together and what makes sense and pressing on the why questions. To get to your point is every 
every work of literature has to have an architecture. And you even a novel as well as no a novel, of course, you can play with it more perhaps. But um and and I began to hear in other people's work and in my own, what it was like finding a path, you know, what what kind of made sense and what how might we map this and what would my way through this be? And it was very, very similar to going out as an NPR correspondent and talking to a million people and gathering all that tape and bringing that back and then saying, oh my God, I've got, you know, four hours for a five minute story. <coughs> what am I going to extract? I will say that journalism, <coughs> journalism is extractive, whereas uh, memoir or I would imagine fiction are much more interior. But it still has to have a structure. I'm thinking about uh, Maggie Nelson's book, Argonauts. Anyone re read that book? I mean, it's a really great, fascinating sort of memoir, nonfiction, general nonfiction hybrid thing. And it's very fashioned from fag fragments. Fragments are its, its gesture in a way. And when I read that, I was sort of reading some other things. Um, uh, Jenny O'Feal's novel, Department of Speculation, is mm -hmm. another example. Yeah, it's a good one Books that are really made out of fragments. Um, and I feel like fragmentation is reflective of our contemporary moment. That, for example, online life is very fragment-oriented. We read fragments online. So there's a lot to me that suggests that fragments can be evocative and meaningful. But what Jackie's saying is exactly true, that if there isn't transit from A to B in a book or in a, um, in a memoir or in any or kind short of- short story, yeah, anything. Yeah. Yeah. If there isn't that sense of movement, if the fragments are just isolated, then the thing has a tendency to kind of sit there without mobilizing the reader. So in a memoir setting, you have to try to find a way to take a fragmentary memory and recast it or contextualize it so that it has more um, narrative power than in, than in a sort of isolated state. Yeah, and that's hard work sometimes. Some stuff has to go. Like even this hmm. Odyssey Works uh, section in my book, it could have easily come out, you know, and there were moments when I was going to not put it in there. Um, but if you're thinking of the superstructure and the movement of the superstructure, sometimes you can make arguments for that kind of material. I have a section in Daughter of the Queen of Sheba that to this day I think I'd take out if I could. It's where I did actually go and join the traveling rodeo. And the traveling rodeo went from Maine to West Virginia. And uh, it's, it seems digressive to me now. And then other times I think that should have been a novel. That should have been a whole short story. And I wound up trying to escape from crooked cops in Nitro, West Virginia. It's a good read and escaped to live with some hillbillies for a week and had a horse accident. And then the crooked cop came into my, into my hospital room and I had to escape in the night. And then I had a car accident. Yeah. So it's in the memoir. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, still not sure that it ought to be. <clears throat> detailed, extremely confessional, and he talks about shame and how he has a lot of shame when he's writing, and he puts things in there that you're cringing that he put them in there, but you can't stop reading it. Have you, have you read his work? Uh, I have only read some excerpts. I haven't. And I think it's, I just have been, you know, I've been working on my own stuff, and I think he would flatten me. Um, you know who I love, as you were talking about the shame, you know who does such a good job with that is Jeanette Winterson in, uh, um, Orange. Orange is not, I wasn't thinking oranges. What, why, why can't you be happy? Why can't you be happy when you could be normal? I think that's the title of that memoir. What's the other one? The orange is not the only. It's a novel though, I think. Yeah. Orange is not the only fruit is a novel. Yeah. Yeah, and the one I'm referring to is um, her memoir, her first memoir. And she starts it, she is locked in the coal cellar 
in, I think it's, it's Wales that she's from or north of England. And shame is just, is like a character in that. But um, no, I haven't tackled the trilogy. Um, have you? I sort of got through one and two and bogged down in three. So I, I there's six all told. Yeah. So I, Yeah. Yeah. So I can't, I feel insufficient to having a, you know, fully formulated opinion, but, but there are parts that I found really moving. Well, we have to say that, you know, he was able to, to, to write that exhaustive detail for a lot of readers who, who admired it. Um, maybe someone else has a memoir here they'd like to suggest to us that we should read. <clears throat> or one last question, right? I think we're at the end. One last question. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.